The title of my talk is Making a Difference. Um, when I came to Jamaica, I used to be called Mel Tennant. Now people meet me and they go, ah, the turtle man. So I stand there and say, no, no, it's Mel. No, no, you're the turtle man. In my previous existence, I taught for 25 years. I did a number of jobs, and every single job that I went to had challenges. And that's what I enjoyed. I enjoyed the challenge. And the gentleman this morning, John, that spoke, talked about Adam, and he's perfectly right. But also the vision thing is what I think is, makes it very important for people. When I became a head teacher and I was at my last school, I basically went to a conference in Newcastle upon Tyne. First time I'd ever been to Newcastle, great place, but went there. And the first speaker was talking about what happens to head teachers under the new stress of the English education system. I thought, wow, this is good. Sat there and the guy said, if you retire at 51, which is the first year you can retire, you have a 30-year life expectancy. Great. If you retire at 60, you might last four and a half years. <laughs> if you carry on till you're 65 and you make it, you've got three and a half months. So I thought, this is a no-brainer. Right, 51, go. Next speaker up was the Minister for Education, who then said, by the way, guys, we've just, spent, we've just actually spent 29 billion pounds of your pension, which we can't get back. 50% of the teaching population are aged between 40 and 50, and we can't retrain enough teachers to replace you, so you stay until you're 60. And I just sat there thinking, that guy's just taken 15 years of my life away. I'm not going to take that. So I then spent the next few years discussing how I could actually get out and escape from teaching. And I was actually sitting on a beach in Salem because we used to come across and visit quite often before we actually moved here. And I'd been snorkeling and we were looking at the coral reef and I'd got a nice ice cold red strip out, stripe out of the igloo. And I thought, why am I bothering? And my wife and I sat down and in 20 minutes we worked out our plan. It took seven years, but seven years later we arrived in Jamaica. As a teacher, I did some really very interesting exceptional things. But I'll explain what we did once we got here. When we actually arrived, we bought a property which needed a lot of renovation, so we started working on it. But it actually is over a beach. And we didn't know anything about sea turtles at all. And then one day, you'll see a slide in the next couple of slides on that shows you what we actually saw. But we, you know, we, we knew very little about sea turtles. But this fact, Last year, Dr. Byron Wilson was doing the EFJ lecture, and he said 99.7% of the historical abundance of sea turtles is now gone. Imagine that, 99.7% has gone. Equally, in, in actually in Jamaica, even though you'd signed up to environmental treaties, between 1970 and 1985, they killed 9,523 turtles to sell their shells to Japan to be used for jewelry and to make marquetry. Because when you hear about turtle shell, it's actually a hawksbill shell. But worse than that, in the Caribbean, who were also selling to the Japanese, an estimated quarter of a million shells, so that's a quarter of a million turtles, were killed. All right? So imagine that. You had this massive abundance of turtles that had been on the earth for 100 million years, and all of a sudden, now, 99.7% are killed, and we're doing it because they make nice trinkets, and that's basically it. So, as I say, our first encounter was in 2004, and the picture you can see behind me is a picture of my balcony, of the beach in front of us, and I live at Oracabessa, and on one side, I've got James Bond Beach, and on the other side, I've got the old UB40 house that used to be their recording studio. When I first arrived here and realized UB40 owned the house next door, I was furious. I come from Birmingham. I know them, <laughs> right? And I don't want to live next door to Ali Campbell because I know what he's like, <laughs> right? 
But there's Ali Campbell living next door. Fortunately, he moved out. And there's a really interesting story about what happened about the house, but I'll tell you at another time. Anyway, we saw these tracks on the beach, and I exercised my Anglo-Saxon words, like what the, you know, the, somebody driving an ATV on my beach for, because I actually thought that was somebody dri driving what I would call a quad bike or an ATV up the beach. My guys turned around to me and said, no, no, boss, boss, no, it's a turtle. I said, I don't believe you, that can't be a turtle, look at it. I said, no, no, it's a turtle. So we go down, and we walk on the beach, and we follow the tracks. And there is my next door neighbor's groundskeeper digging up the eggs. Now, this person is actually called Mr. Trusty. That's his real name. And he's the most inappropriately named person I have ever met. <laughs> but, being a former teacher, it was walk up behind him, slap him around the back of the head, wag my finger at him and say, if you ever do that again, you know what's going to happen to you. Unfortunately, that stopped that. But what then started to happen is we started walking up and down the beach every morning and we counted 14 sets of tracks that season. Okay? We may have missed some, but basically we counted 14. We thought, wow, you know, 14. The next season, we were walking up and down and we noticed again, June came, turtle tracks appeared. But then later, when we got into August, we saw the little turtle tracks going out. We thought, wow, turtle tracks. Whoa, let's follow this. Found where the nest was, dig it up count the shells, and we estimate that in that year, the 2005 year, we had about 500 turtles hatched. Now, since then, we've done a bit of research, and NEPA are a body which I actually have got a great deal of respect for. I know people malign them, but I actually work with a number of people, and what they support me, and they're very good. They're just underfunded. They haven't got enough people to do the job that they're paid to do. So, NEPA start showing me figures, and it said that they would got two recent surveys, one in 1983, and it showed that there were 27 nests on my beach. In 1993, there were 10, okay? We counted 14 sets of tracks, but didn't know how many actual turtles that was, but it equates, if we know now, if you divide any number that of tracks by five, that's the number of turtles that came up, so we probably had three that actually came up in that year. We started counting, we put about 500, we think 500 went back, but what we didn't know is that as they go across the beach, crabs eat them. We've got grey heron on the beach, and they eat them. Mongoose will come and dig up the eggs and eat them. If there are dogs around, they'll eat them, right? So that little 30, 40 yard dash across the beach is probably the most dangerous thing they're going to do until they get in the sea, because when they get in the sea, that's full of fish that want to eat them. And then they swim out until they get to the tide, the current, in about four or five hundred foot of water, and then they actually stop swimming. They just literally curl up, put their head down, and the current takes them. And it takes them all the way past Florida, into the Atlantic, round in the Atlantic to the other side of the Caribbean, down past the Leeward Windward Islands until they get to South America, along the South American coast, and then it brings them back, and it takes two years. So when a turtle comes up and lays, she doesn't come back for two years because that's the trek that she does. And they always come back to the beach they were laid on to lay their eggs. So my turtles that I saw go out in 2004, when they're around 18, the females will come back, okay? And they'll come back to my beach. So we started looking and we started doing different things. And as we started to get into it, we started saying, oh, you know, how can we make this better? Because when we got into 2006, we suddenly saw one nest that was laid and we knew exactly where it was. And we counted the number of days from when we saw a turtle to when we saw it hatch. And we knew it was around 60 days. When it got to 80 days, we went and dug this nest up and we had about 150 perfectly formed baby turtles, but dead because it had rained heavily. And if it rains heavily, it forms like a, a block of sand across the top of the nest that the turtles can't get out of. So we thought, we've got to do something about this. But then to find where the eggs are buried was like a big, you know, it's a, it's a treasure hunt. You know, well, is it there, is it there? So we suddenly thought, ah, 2007, all along the beach, measuring, getting it all marked out marking a map out for each of the different sections, and then eventually we put nails into the rocks, and when we found where a nest was, we measured, and we, make, we kept a record. 
So every time it then rained, we dug them up, well, we dug them up to release them at the right time to let them go. What we then discovered was that walking across the beach because you lose about 30%, if we did this for all the nests, we'd have 30% more turtles going back than we would normally have through nature. So we thought, well, that's a good idea. Let's do that. And one thing led to another. And now, in our season 2012, this is my Bible. Okay? In there, I've got my maps of every single turtle that's been up on my beach, where it came up, where it's been, and then when I go into the next section, how many eggs were laid, how many hatched, how many were successful, and the reasons why not. And at the back here are the pictures of my ladies, which just like hurricanes are now named. So there's Abigail, that was the first one up. And as we click through, all of my turtles are there, so that when they come up on the beach at night, I can actually spot them by the marks on the back of the shell, as well as the fact that they've got tags on them. Now, when you actually start to do that, it becomes actually very interesting because what you start to be able to pick up on is the fact that this is what the turtle looks like as it comes across the beach, okay? And as it comes across the beach, you can see the track that it leads behind it. So you've got that coming in, you follow it round, she digs a nest, and when she digs a nest, she takes the, the line of the sand and she digs a sloping pit. Then with those back flippers, she digs a hole that's about eight to 10 inches in diameter and maybe a foot deep. And then what she does is this. She lays her eggs. Now watch as the eggs come out. Now, ladies that have had children, I understand that when you're actually giving birth, you obviously have to push. Watch her back flippers and you'll see that the female turtles have an affinity to you. Okay, because you're watching a second, you'll watch the, the back flippers suddenly start to move, and there she comes, push, and out come the eggs. The eggs are the same size as a table tennis or a ping pong ball if you're American, okay? And she will lay anywhere between 120 and 240 of those. And when she comes out and she starts to lay, she goes into a trance, okay? When she's in that trance, you can go up, you can measure her, you can tag her, you can photograph her, and she's fine, right? She also looks like she's crying, but she's not, because sea turtles take in salt water, and they actually, but they drink fresh water. So as it goes in, it filters, and when it filters, the salts come out from behind the eyes. So as she's there laying, little tears come down the side, but it's actually just a natural process of salt, okay? What I also do is, just run over here for a second. Oh, there they are. What I do as well is I take these metal tags which are issued by WIDECAS, which is based at the University of the West Indies in Barbados. And when you actually take the front flipper, there are three scales. And what you do is you apply that to the scale. Now when I got taught to do this, they said, oh, it's really easy this. Take this piece of cardboard and tag it. Great. Didn't move, no problem at all. You get a real live turtle, it's not the same. Okay? Once she moves, and you've got to get that little pin through the hole and bend it so it's properly located. So the first time I tagged the turtle, I missed because she pulled. So then you find, ah, right, put the disinfectant, rubbing alcohol on to make sure that she doesn't get infected, massage the scales. And she start, she's sitting there, she's having a massage, so she's quite happy, and then, and then you tag her. And after that, she's really, she is actually happy. Now, once you actually get that happening, if the turtles come out naturally, this is what it looks like. Okay? They dig their way out from the bottom of the nest, and as they're moving, the sand from above falls between them, and it's like a sand elevator lifting them up. When they get to the top and it's light, the first one says, stop, boys, stop, and everybody stops. As soon as it gets dark, they dig again, and out they come. This one I happened to spot because the herons were having a field day on the beach eating something, and I thought they were crabs. And I looked down and realized it was turtles, so off my balcony, a big rock comes down to scare the bird. Then I rush down, 
and made sure the birds and all the crabs had gone, and then basically just photographed them coming out the nest. But as I know, they get eaten as they go across. So we've developed a little technique. And our new technique is this. I go and I dig them up. Now, this is good fun, right? When people visit my beach, you go down on your hands and knees, <coughs> and you start digging, and they can't see where the nest is, but I know where they all are. And I'm first couple of turtles come out, and everybody's going, oh, and then you pick a big handful of turtles and drop them down, and everybody's going, wow. It's great until you go to San Susi, because I help San Susi. So the first time we had a nest at San Susi, I'm on the beach, and there I am, and I'm digging away, and I've got turtles coming out, and these feet appear. And I look up, and there's this man's penis in my face. Because <laughs> it's the nude beach, and I thought, I didn't sign up for this. <laughs> So, what we then do now is we take those turtles and we pop them into the bucket. Then we put the bucket over, and then when we've got a group of children, we get them to bet on which one's going to get out first. And that's what they look like when they go across the sand. Okay? So they race across, and you can see they're all going in the same direction. They all know where the sea is. They may go at a slight angle to get away from the mass, but basically they go. So when people come on my beach, that's what they actually see. Once we've actually let them go, how successful have we been? Well, let's just show you this. The number of turtles coming on my beach in 2004 was 14. As of last week, 195. <laughs> First year, 500, but we know only about 350 got back. Last year, we put 3,000, 13,000, sorry, 353 back in the sea. And because of the way that we look after them, we know they all got into the sea and they all got out properly. So, where do I go next? Last two minutes. I need to increase the nesting space on my beach. Fortunately, the hotel next door to us has been bought by Kingston Live Entertainment, and their logo is a hawksbill turtle and they're really into what we're doing, so we haven't got any problem with the development they're doing. We're quite cool about that. The nest temperature. Interestingly, the eggs are sex by temperature. If it's above 28.2 degrees centigrade, female. Below that, male. So I always remember it by hot girls on top, cool guys underneath. <laughs> OK, nest seasonality. That means when I get a nest laid now, it won't hatch. Instead of being 60 days, it'll be 120 days. So I'm going to start to dig them up, and I'm going to start to actually incubate them so that we're going to get a much greater you know, amount that are done. The next thing along for me, and this is the most important thing, this is the NEPA document that's called the Sea Turtle Recovery Action Plan. This is how what I've been doing gets spread across the island. It can only be done through community involvement, and having a white foreigner doing this is no good. It's got to be Jamaicans. My Jamaican, in our fish sanctuary in front of us, we now have a really well-organized Oracabessa Bay fish sanctuary. The fishermen are now my greatest protectors of my turtles. And when that happens around the Jamaican coast, that the fishermen are there protecting the turtles, and the people that live close are looking and monitoring them, then we're going to be successful. And in five years, what I want is the best turtle monitoring in the world. Thank you very much.